In this video, we focus on aggregate preferred expenditure and its components. To understand what determines GDP, we need to understand different components of GDP. Where does expenditure come from? From households, from investors, from government, from the rest of the world. We've discussed this in a previous course, and we discovered that it's convenient to divide up expenditure into four categories, government expenditure, private consumption, investment, and net exports. By preferred expenditure, I mean amounts that people would like to spend given their circumstances. Those circumstances themselves may depend on expenditure, but that's something that we will discuss later on. Let's start by two variables, government expenditure and taxes. And I'm going to assume they're exogenous, they're given. This may look unrealistic because taxes especially should depend on income. But we make these assumptions to simplify the analysis. That's the main point is not so much to be correct at this stage, is to develop a model, understand how it behaves, and then put in realism in it. And in the case of taxes, you're going to see that actually it doesn't make much of a difference if I write it as an endogenous variable as a function of income or as an exogenous variable. One actually can extend the analysis from a model with fixed taxes, exogenous taxes, into another one where taxes are endogenous. Uh, a lot of results carry, and it's an e easy exercise and an interesting exercise in itself. But it's much easier to start with exogenous taxes. And government expenditure, similarly, it probably depends on a lot of variables, but that's a political process, and we're going to take it as given for now. Later on, come back and see what factors might be driving government expenditure. The next variable we're going to focus on is private consumption. The preferred private consumption, how much consumers would like to spend given their circumstances, should depend on a host of variables. And let me list some here. And let's start thinking about them one by one. The first variable that probably dr drives private consumption is after-tax income, or what we call in economics disposable income. Wealth is another variable that should affect one's consumption decision. You might say that interest rates also might be important. In this case, I'm focusing on real interest rate. Another variable could be price level. Or you might say some other variables that we can discuss later on. Now let's focus on private consumption as a function of after-tax income. I'm going to write the consumption function as C of Y minus T. So this expression up here is telling us that our consumption is a function of our income minus net taxes. I'm, us I'm using the same letter C that represents consumption as also the name of the function, the function that connects disposable income to the amount people would like to consume. This just reduces the number of symbols that we need to use. A lot of times, people might, be, might prefer to use another uh, letter, for example, like f of y minus t. But that, that will introduce too many letters and would make it difficult to follow the analysis. So let's just focus on using the letter c, representing consumption as a function of disposable income. So let's graph this function. It's, if, one graphs function if, if one graphs consumption as a function of disposable income, it looks something like this. This is what this curve is telling us. If our income is y0, then we can find the vertical axis coordinate corresponding to this level of income via the consumption function, and that tells us how much expenditure we would like to have given our level of income. Consumption function has particular characteristics that are important for the analysis of macroeconomic equilibrium. One key feature is that it's flatter than the 45-degree line. The 45-degree line has a particular characteristic. 
it has equal coordinates. For example, if I choose a point here on the green line, 45 degree line, its coordinates are y0 and y0. It represents a situation where households spend every dollar that they earn. So if their income is y0, their consumption is y0. But that's not actually what people do. Normally, if income is y0, people save some of it. They also have to pay taxes. So their consumption is less than the amount that they earn. So this difference between income and consumption is taxes plus private savings. However, notice that at low levels of income, expenditure could be bigger than the income level, especially if our income is zero, our consumption here is going to be bigger than zero. And that's natural, because if you have low income, you still need to survive, so you need to spend. Either you borrow and spend, or you use your past savings and spend, and therefore consumption is always going to be positive at low levels of income. At some point, it becomes equal to income level. But normally, consumption is less than income. Back to the feature that I mentioned that the cons consumption function is flatter than the 45 degree line. What it really says is that every dollar that we earn, we spend part of it and save part of it. So if, if we spent every dollar that we earned, then the blue line, the consumption function, would be parallel to the 45 degree line. But actually, people save a portion of their income, and as a result, the consumption function is going to be flatter than the 45 degree line. The slope of consumption function represents the marginal propensity to consume. Now let's look at other factors that may be affecting preferred expenditure by households. One key variable in this regard is wealth. Wealthier, the wealthier people are, the more they spend and the less they need to save out of their current income. Especially if wealth grows, people who earn money may decide that they don't need to save out of their current income because the amount of savings they would like to have or the wealth they, that they would like to have for the future is already growing on its own. Let's say you own a lot of stocks and the stock market goes up, so you feel richer. If your current income is given and you're saving part of it, you may actually save a smaller portion of it. So when wealth goes up, consumption goes up at every level of income. And as a result, for a given level of income, Y0, we're going to have higher consumption. That also means that private savings have to shrink. So rather than being the distance between Y0 and C0, it's now the distance between Y0 and C1. So the next variable we look at is the interest rate. We would like to know how interest rate might be affecting private consumption. So let me ask you this question. You have some money and you've been put it in the bank and interest rate goes up. Would you consume more, save more, or neither, not change your saving behavior? Think about also the impact of interest rate on investment that you may want to be making. And remember that I'm referring to investment as act of creating production capacity, not the act of saving, which is setting aside part of your income for, to, to put into some interest bearing or uh, other financial asset. Probably the answer that I'm going to give you to this question is going to surprise you. Some of you probably know the answer, and the answer is neither. It's not very clear which way it might be going. So it, this might surprise you. So let me explain this in a bit of detail with an example. Suppose that your annual income is $100,000, and you also have $100,000 in the bank earning interest on it. Let's say 5%. And let's say the account is up for renewal, and the, in and the interest rate has remained the same. You have a number of options. You can 
keep the account the same as before, take some of the money out of it, or add money to it out of your current income. Let's assume that at current interest rate 5% and the income level that you have, you, you choose to keep the account intact the way it is and renew it. So these are the assumptions, the situation we're starting with. Here comes a change that we need to think about. Suppose when you want to renew, you get this letter from your bank that says you're a good customer and we would like to give you a prize of $3,000 at the end of the year if you renew your account. So what would you do in this case? Would you be saving a little bit more of your income, put it in the account? Would you be taking money out of the account in order to consume a little bit more? What would be your preferred decision here? Let's think about this for a moment and let me tell you what I think most people do in these situations. If I were to get the, such a letter from the bank, I would actually increase my consumption because the letter basically tells me that my income by the end of the year has gone up $3,000. So in the current year, rather than saving the same amount or behaving this, the way I used to, I may actually consume a bit more. Now, what does this have to do with the increase in interest rate? Just think about this. If interest rate had gone from 5% to 8%, you would be getting, again, 3000 more than you did in the previous year. It's like a price to you. So that encourages you to consume. However, there's a slight difference between getting a fixed amount of price at the end of the year versus a higher interest rate. The higher interest rate applies to any additional amount that you save. So it motivates you to save more. But the increased income that comes from it actually discourages you from saving because you're going to be richer in the future and therefore you're likely to want to spend a bit more right now. Now that you have more money in the future, whatever was the purpose of that saving for the future, you have the money. So you don't need to save as much as you did before. So let me explain this in a slightly different way. An increase in interest rates has two opposite effects on savings. One is called substitution effect, the other one is called income effect. The substitution effect encourages you to save more and substitute future consumption for current consumption. The income effect tells you that you're going to be richer in the future and therefore that discourages you from saving more right now because you already are getting more income in the future from the interest rate. Empirically, the net effect is not very clear. It depends on the situation, and there's no systematic result that if interest rates go up, you save more or you save less. That's why we don't put the interest rate in the consumption function, and in the rest of this course, we're going to assume that the interest rate does not have a systematic impact on consumption. Another variable that you might say should have an effect on consumption is price level. If I ask you what would you do by way of consumption if price level goes up, given your real income and other variables, a lot of people Im immediately think that the price level goes up, I'll buy less. However, that's tricky because given the level of income, real income, actually the decision of how much you want to consume should not depend on nominal prices. When price level goes up, it means that you pay more, but also the factors that you provide to the market also are going to be priced higher because that's all general, all, because all prices are going up. The general price level is going up. So somebody's going to be earning that money based on the higher prices. So wages are going to be similarly going up, or profits are going to be going up, or all of them. So higher prices do not necessarily affect consumption because of the general equilibrium effect. Higher prices mean higher, higher nominal income. So as long as real income is given, we're not going to see much of an impact on consumption. So we don't put the price level in the consumption function either, like the interest rate.